Thank you for joining us for Let the Prophet Speak. This week, Dr. Rosier will be giving the history of Fellowship Church of Praise, the ministry that she co-founded with her husband, Dr. David Rosier. Join her as she travels back and gives a view of their meager beginnings and brings us all the way to her current ministry today. Thank you for watching Let the Prophet Speak and helping us reach the nations. Sanders Lane, my husband and I, when we separated from the Air Force, I went through and found, and I don't know what attracted me to you. I know, I was trying to find something that we could afford so he would not feel bad because the Lord had given me a vivid dream that he wanted us to stay in Panama City and start a ministry to start a work. So in order to separate from the military, I needed to find us some place to stay and he wouldn't feel the pressure of uh, staying with the military. So, so when we moved here, my husband went back to school. That's when he worked on his education degree. Uh, he had a paper route at night. Sometimes I would ride with him all night um, to deliver papers and to go to school full time. And here is where Gerard went to Head Start. The bus would pick him up right out there in front of the house. I have little pictures of him with his little clown outfit that his mommy made for one of his field day trips. But in this house was where Peter Henderson, one of my mentors, would come. And when they would come into town, uh, the kids, we'd put them in the bedroom with us and let Peter Henderson have the other bedroom just so that I could hear about uh, the visions that he had. He was from East St. Louis, Illinois, i never forget. Played the guitar, a little short guy would prophesy until they would take the guitar off of him. Uh, he would actually see visions of maybe a buffalo nickel and that would tell him that God wanted him to go to Buffalo, New York. It was my first exposure with symbolism, prophets that saw in symbols and types. And I would sit at the dining table in here and cook and just listen to him talk for hours. I was so intrigued. At that time, I had no idea God would open my eyes to see visions. I had no idea at that time he would open my son's eyes. Uh, David Gerard, whose eyes opened before mine. I was just intrigued by the gifts and intrigued by people that flowed in the gifts because my grandmother knew things. She was a sharp discerner and intercessor and I didn't know the proper label or title or name of it, so it baited me for life. Here, um, we called it the sweat box because there was no air conditioning. So I literally, for the first time in my life, I was exposed to poverty. After getting married, I grew up with grandparents taking good care of me, uh, me having what I would consider a very privileged life. I had a car before I had a driver's license. I had the nicest of things, grew up on a 150 acre farm. So I didn't know what it was to not have money. There was not a day in my life that I wondered where I was going to get money from. But when we moved here, literally I would have to cook, lean over on the wall because my sight would leave me. It was so hot in this apartment. Uh, but it was in this place that I would go to bed and that was my bedroom right there where you see that first window. And I remember I would make sure the kids were asleep and my husband was asleep and get up and meet the Lord in the living room nightly. I would have this appointed time that I would look forward to going and sitting on the couch and saying to the Lord, it's just finally you and I. And that started me setting times that he and I would meet and he and I would talk. I just saw it as a date with the Lord and looked forward to it. I felt the excitement it was here. I experienced that type of anointing. Listening to Peter, Peter Henderson talk about the gifts and talk about seeing and my intercessory prayer life, my fasting life, much of which started here. When we were living in this place, uh, my husband would, during the day after his classes, would have a noonday Bible study. It was in this place that Fred Skelton came and gave his life to the Lord. Cleata Stanley, Fred Skelton was working at the paper mill. And Cleata Stanley, who was born with polio, had one leg shorter than another than the other and literally walked limping, walked sideways like this, lifting his leg. It was in this place, in a noonday prayer, that Cleata Stanley's leg grew out. And it was Fred that witnessed the fact that his leg grew out here. I remember Cleata being slain under the power of God in a noonday prayer. We didn't know anything about being slain. We just experienced the Shekinah glory. We experienced God's power without knowing anything about it, just reading in the Bible and knowing that God would do it. His leg grew out. Fred started screaming, look, his leg grew out. And as a result of that, Fred 
got rid of his pipe, got rid of his marijuana, his drugs, gave his life to the Lord, and Fred still works the sound system until this day. But it drew him, before we had a church building, this was house to house, church in the house. It was in this house, there was notable miracles. Um, Angie Baltazar, Lester Baltazar, gave their life to the Lord and changed their life forever. Lester was in the Air Force and literally traveling to New Orleans and Orlando, I hope the statute of limitations has passed, selling drugs <laughs> and getting high. He and Larry Williams, God touched their lives in this house. So a lot of great things happened in this house. Miracles, signs and wonders, praising God in this house. Just a noonday Bible study. My husband just sharing the word and we applying the word and believing the word and experiencing, noticing there were notable uh, miracles in this house. Springfield Housing Authority, this is where I taught an enrichment program. Everywhere that I went and had children, I also had a heart for children. I would teach an after-school program and tutor kids that were in school that perhaps they were having struggles, underprivileged children. I would prepare the kids for school. I bought materials, developed the materials, and literally taught them how to write, taught them the alphabets, taught them phonics, taught them how to read, sight reading, um, anything that would prepare them for school and help them to achieve and do well academically. It was one of my starting places before going to Tyndall Air Force Base. I actually would have, by the time we bought a building, I would actually meet in St. Andrew Project Housing Authority and Teaching and Enrichment Program there one day a week. Springfield Housing Authority Teaching and Enrichment Educational Program one day a week. I would actually go to Foxwood Projects, teach there one day a week and go on Tyndall Air Force Base in the chapel and teach there. So every day of the week I was doing an educational enrichment program with no grant money, just uh, the love and concern for children thriving and doing well, and especially children of color. So I would purchase all the materials myself, pay for my own gas. Now I wish I knew about all the grants that were available, but this was prior to starting Fellowship Academy. I had no idea that God was building my reputation and he was also having me to make an investment in the lives of kids. We're here, Gerard and Byron, and you can only have two kids staying here. So we were actually staying here, two bedroom, townhouse, government housing. This is our meager history. Uh, Pastor David, myself, that Gerard and Byron here at Briarwood. And actually, I would walk across to the other apartment, and um, Melanie was living across there, Melanie McDonald. She was Melanie Burlstein. And she and I would go to the laundromat together and we just, she would watch my kids, I would watch hers, and we would just talk and have a good time in the laundry mat while we lived here. Wow, this is really an emotional part of my journey. I'm standing here, and it is now uh, Springfield Library, but it was Springfield Health Department. And I actually worked for Bay County Health Department at the time. I ran the WIC program, and right down the street, I worked for United Cerebral Palsy Zero to Three program. So as a result of that, we would meet right over here on the left-hand side where I actually uh, met and gave out WIC coupons and taught the parent health education classes for the parents and helping them with their babies and um, different things that they may need for uh, healthy development. And as a result of that, we would have Bible study here in the, what was the auditorium. We would have Bible study there. And around that same year that we had the Bible study, my daughter Deborah was six months old. I talked about this over and over, being thrown from the car, thrown from my arms, driving out to Timber Parkway, uh, thrown from the car. The car was totaled. It threw her and kept spinning. Uh, she was unconscious when the ambulance picked her up, spent the night in the hospital. They ran a battery of tests, could not find anything wrong. And it was right here that I brought her that night in her carrier when they couldn't figure out why she wouldn't sit up or turn her neck. I sat her up on the platform or the little area where I would dispense with coupons. 
And literally during praise and worship, she sat up in her carrier and started turning her neck. I knew at that moment she would be a praiser, a singer, a praise and worship leader. And today, history or the prophetic fulfillment of her destiny, I hate she was thrown from the car, but the fact that it manifested out of a tragic situation to see her flowing in her giftings as a result of that. And this is one of the stops on our journey. Here, my husband and had David Gerard and Byron O'Neill. We were living here when we bought the or rented the sweat box in Lynn Haven. It was in this house, this very apartment, that uh, I was laying down praying and contemplating suicide. It was in this house that a prophet came to visit and just literally made me want to take my life right here in this house. So I really. Uh, just looking at my history and looking at where I've come from and what I've gone through. I was staying here and it was God that saved my life. The reason I didn't lose my life when we were living here. This is just a part of the journey, a part of our history. This is Fellowship Church of Praise history. I am standing in front of a building in Lynn Haven, which was our first building prior to buying a church on downtown and from in front of Tommy Oliver Stadium but it was in this building when we talk about church history it was called the sweat box we called it the sweat box because it was so many of us crammed in this building it was cooler outside than it was on the inside it was in this building that David Forward drove by one night with his guitar and Henry Hogue and they came in and played the guitar. It was in this building that David Gerard Rozier started playing the drums and he was maybe four years old, five years old, playing the drums. His arms were so tired that he literally saw an angel appear and start massaging his arms and he played for the entire praise and worship. It was in this building that we had noonday prayer and Byron prayed about or was crying about everybody has a gift and he doesn't have one. And in a noonday prayer, I prayed for him, anointed him, and literally the Lord anointed his hands to play the guitar. And actually a blue fire appeared in Byron's hands to lay hands on the sick and they were healed. After then, he was a little boy. He laid hands on individuals and they were healed. It was in this building, uh, I was taking Gerard home, preparing him to go to school the next day, uh, kindergarten. And he fell asleep in the car. On the way home, Gerard woke up and said, Mom, go back to church. And he was talking about this building. He told me exactly what the pastor would be preaching when we get back to church. When I walked in the back door, the pastor was preaching exactly what Gerard said. The gift blossomed in that five-year-old in this building. The anointing to heal blossomed in this building with uh, Byron as well. It was in this building that I started hearing prophecies and I was too terrified to say what I heard. I would write it down, I would hand it to my husband and he would read it in this Build. In this building, sweat box, and Amber Scott started coming here to what they call the sweat box. And we literally, in this building, I had De Devron in a carrier uh, about the same size and probably much younger than um, Destiny's little Destiny. And it was in this building that we would dance and praise God until someone else had to back up against the wall and make room for us, us to sing and to praise God. So this was the fellowship, the first building for Fellowship Church of Praise. I came to this building after a prophet gave me a word that made me want to commit suicide. There are prophetic words that can resurrect you and there are prophetic words that can literally take your breath away and make you long for death. For the first and only time that I was ever suicidal, I came to this building after laying down at home and saying to the Lord all day long, just fasting, praying and saying, God, if you don't speak to me, I'm going to take my own life. And I had planned how I would commit suicide, that I would drive into the Lynn Haven Bridge and just really uh, throw up my hands and let the car crash. But I came to this building and I walked in for the service and I remember this prophet stood up and he said, somebody's been talking to God all day. 
And it was the beginning of me seeking detailed prophecies and giving detailed prophecies. It's my motivation for giving detailed prophecies. I remember saying to the Lord, that's not sufficient. If he doesn't call me out by name, and if you don't tell me what I said and tell me what you said about it, I'm going to take my own life. This prophet, Peter Henderson, stood up. He said, I see fire around your belly. I see fire around your feet. And the Lord said that you are a rose in God's hand. You are a mother in Zion. Don't let anybody ever un make you underestimate who you are to God. And certain things will not go right in this ministry if you're not in this ministry. That prophecy resurrected me. It took the spirit of suicide off of me. It made me want to live again. It told me my place within ministry, told me how God felt about me. And even to this day, every time I see a rose, I remember that I was a rose, that I am a rose in God's hand. But it was in this building that God spoke through a prophet. And I had no idea at the time I was pregnant with Marcus Joel Rozier. And the enemy was trying to get me to take my life so I wouldn't give birth to jo Marcus Joel Rozier, who's impacting us, uh, impacting the world. And a word of the Lord came to me much later after that, that he would impact the world, that it would change lives. I didn't know why the enemy was trying to get me to take my life so that he wouldn't be born, so that the world would miss out on Marcus Joel Rozier. This apartment, we're in Foxwood, they call it the Foxwood Projects. It was very new then. I remember when they first built them. I moved from Lynn Haven to, from Havenwood Apartments to Foxwood Apartments. And these were brand new. I actually used to teach an after school program. I started an after school program, an enrichment program in the office, which we'll see in a few minutes, the office complex. But I would go over there and teach the kids and prepare them for school since by that time I had my degree, I was just at home, chose to be at home to raise all four of my kids. So I didn't want to start back teaching until they were in school. So I actually would work to enhance the other kids' lives over here. We lived in Foxwood Projects, and it was in this apartment. We came home from church one night, which we're going to see the church in a few minutes, and someone actually shot in the apartment while a woman was chasing her husband, shot in the apartment, and a bullet went straight through a spot that normally I would be sitting there in Gerard and Byron and watching television. It was in this apartment. Once again, that I came home and prayed and asked God to take me, and I had the dream about the death angel. It was in this apartment that I had visions, so every place that I landed or God took me, there was dreams, there was visions, there was word of knowledge, there was prophecy. Gifts were involved. I was budding and blossoming and had no idea in the midst of all of the trials and tests and struggles that God was also developing the gifts in me. We left Lynn Haven called the Sweat Box, where we had our name on the building. We were so proud to actually rent a building. We probably had 20 members, and we were so excited, content. Just we did at that time a 60 or six-month revival every day for six months. God was opening eyes, and people were seeing visions, and people that never prophesied were prophesying. We weren't just learning about the gifts; we were experiencing the gifts. Uh, healing was happening, miracles were happening. Uh, literally, people had teeth that were filled. People that had cavities literally was able to show filling, gold filling. Some of them had a gold cross in their teeth that it was just the miraculous. Uh, creative miracles that but they couldn't afford to go to the doctor to pay for a health fix. God worked those kind of miracles. This was the first building that we bought. We sold chicken dinners, we sold fish dinners, we sold cookies, we did roadblocks. I don't know if they do those now. We literally were standing on the corner with a little container asking people to give to the after school program. Give, and we had an after school program here. Bought this building. Um, I put the carpet that they put down in this building. I used my very first credit card from college. Maxed out my credit card by a miracle, and the help of God, I was able to pay it off. But literally used my credit card to carpet this building, a really large size building. It was thousands then to buy carpet for the building, to uh, buy pews. Uh, my husband came to work here for $100 a week, 
and I was at home with the four kids, and of course he had children from a previous marriage, so he had child support and taking care of all of us on $100 a week and paying tithe, giving offerings, because I've always believed in tithe, always believed in offering. I look back now and don't know how we made it, but by the grace of God, we made it. But in this building, we were in this building for 13 years. And after 13 years, the Lord spoke to us to leave, and he had a place he wanted us to go, and by that time, we met full gospel businessmen that used to come to this building. It was in this building that was prophesying, uh, laying hands on people. It was in this building, literally at this ramp that the Lord opened my eyes and I saw this massive angel and winged horse uh, with an angel with a sword in his hand that was showing blood on the sword where he'd already fighting for us. It was um, in this building the first time that I had a word of knowledge that terrified me. I ministered to a lady told her about a pacemaker, had never seen a pacemaker in my life, and said to her, you have a pacemaker. It wasn't until the lady asked me, how do you know that I realized, good God, I don't even know how I know. But literally, I had a word of knowledge, knowledge about something earthly that I'd never seen in my life, but heaven downloaded it. The lady had had a pacemaker put in two days prior to coming to that service. Those are the type of things that the Lord would just simply show uh, in this service was Gulf Coast Seminary that my husband and I graduated from. Dr. Yates at the time was the owner of Gulf Coast Seminary and after the graduation, knowing that we were pastors, she asked us to buy this building and this is where Fellowship Academy was born, in this building. Fellowship Church of Praise, we purchased this building, paid it off in about three and a half years and all of these, there were rooms that we used for the classrooms actually starting at K3 through 12th grade. We were so smart that we started out all levels at one time. Well, we were, weren't smart enough to know to do it in phases, but God was with us. I was bivocational, full-time ministry, and I also taught at Port St. Joe High School. So I would come here in the afternoons, organize the curriculum. We'd go out to Texas for certification with the teachers, go to Orlando around Thanksgiving time for the teachers' convention, as well as doing taking care of my secular job. I would come here in the afternoon and make sure that all the lesson plans were in and review them and drop my kids off to school and hired. It was in this building um, that Rosalind Bess was one of our teachers, Charlotte Blue was one of our teachers. All of those people now are teaching in the public school system. Um, Cynthia, who was Williams at that time, is now running for judge. Fellowship Academy carries so many memories. We would have chapel, we would have graduation exercises, we would have an Easter program, we would have a Christmas program from plays to dance, to mime, which just accelerated here until the Lord spoke to us and took us to another building, which is almost walking distance from here, but spoke to us. We went to another building, 2511 East 3rd Street for a revival. And when I walked in that building again, the Lord said, this is your building. But in this building, I was ordained as an elder in this building. This was my husband's office right here. Behind this, I don't know what's going on on the inside now, but that was my husband's office there. And over to the right, that was my office. You would come in that way, and that was the principal's office. Walk straight through those doors and in that office, and then the cafeteria was to the right, and then the number of classrooms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Dr. Joyner had a classroom in the very back, and Dr. Joyner was an attorney that actually was the administrator out at Charlie Fowler School. When I actually took Gerard and Byron out there to enroll them in a private school, Dr. Joyner talked to me about starting our own and he helped us with incorporation to start our own school under the conditions that I would let him rent a classroom for his academy that he was studying. And we stayed here until the Lord spoke to us to move to a larger facility for the school to grow and the church to grow. And some of the members, somewhat disgruntled, thought, what are we going to do with a larger sanctuary? Thought we couldn't fill it in, and God moved again. But miracle signs and wonders happened from the projection team to the choir to revival. It was in this building in 1987. We started our incorporation as well.
Okay, we are here, the present home of Fellowship Church of Praise. We came over here, heard the word of the Lord. My husband and I came in this building attending a revival, and when I walked inside, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is your building. I shared it with my husband. My husband said, this is not my building. We've just paid off 318 School Avenue after three and a half years. My husband went down to the courthouse because one of our members had to appear in court and he went down to support that member. The deputy at the time, uh, as my husband walked in, said, I had a dream about you last night. He said, in the dream, I dream you bought this building that Pastor Tommy Barnes was selling and told him the amount that he offered Pastor Barnes in the dream. That same night we went to Shoney's, and, which was Shoney's on 23rd Street. Pastor Barnes walked in as we were sitting there eating, asked my husband, do you know anybody that want to buy a building? I'm selling a building. He knew for certain that it had to be God from the top of the day with the deputy saying, I dream you bought the building, to ending the day with Tommy Barnes walking over asking my husband, does he know anybody that wants to buy the building? My husband offered him an amount that the deputy saw in the dream. Tommy Bond said, I'll take it. How soon can we close? We closed on the building and paid this building off in a little over the amount of time that we spent at 318 School Avenue, four or five years, we paid this one off. God blessed us immensely. Here we have three different levels from, um, there's an apartment over on the right-hand side, top level underneath it. There was a church that was renting out that particular area because it's a small sanctuary. Eventually, after they moved out, we turned it into the sixth grade or junior high classroom. Coming down the hall, there was a full nursery. And around the other side, we had classrooms from elementary school through senior high. The senior high classroom was underneath the sanctuary, which is now the seminary classroom. The actual dining area that we use for pastoral dining and a number of things was a restaurant. There was a local individual that rented it out for a restaurant and a lot of the law enforcement uh, individuals would come here and have lunch. I came here for a ladies luncheon, had no idea that we would end up purchasing this building after renting that restaurant for a ladies luncheon. So there's a rich, rich history surrounding this building. In this building, the academy grew. We had the academy for 20 years, and I closed after the 20th year. So this is a part of the rich history. Hope you enjoyed the journey with us. It's been kind of a lengthy journey. Took me down memory lane, but this is where we are until we procured the land and build our next facility from ground up.